Welcome to Celebration Church. If you're watching online, we're so glad to have you. If you are here with us today and visiting, we're also glad that you are here with us in person. Uh, we love it when people come and visit and worship with us. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at Celebration Church. And if you missed last week, if you're tuning in for the first time, we have been walking through the book of Romans. And last week, we took the first 12 verses of chapter 14 of Romans. And today, we are going to be finishing, hopefully, the next set of verses in chapter 14. And I want to kind of, if you missed last week, if you couldn't able, weren't able to be here, look, we still have a lot of people out. We have people that have lost family members. We have people who are sick, people who are traveling. So please be in prayer for those people. But if you missed last week, Paul began to open us up in, in Romans chapter 14 and instruct us on how to treat our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ when it comes to freedom in Christ, when it comes to what we call the non-essentials of the faith. And he used two terms that you, if you weren't here last week, it might throw you off. So let me uh, kind of explain this week. He used what's called the the stronger brother or the stronger Christian and the weaker. Now, like I said last week, Paul is not talking about physical strength here. He, he's really not even talking about mental strength. What he's talking about is those brothers being the stronger brothers who have been around a little bit. They've been in the faith longer. God has been maturing them spiritually. In other words, they're not drinking the milk anymore. They've been eating the meat. Amen. Now, if you're vegan, you're still allowed here, so that, that plays into what we're going to talk about today and last week. So don't be offended that I said eat meat. And of course, the weaker, he, what he was saying about the weaker is that they are, again, they're believers, but they have not maybe been in the faith long enough, and so they were still holding on to a lot of the old covenant laws and practices and festivals, if you will, of the Old Testament. And most of these weaker brothers were Jews, and a lot of the stronger brothers and sisters were Gentiles. And so Paul told us last week that what we need to be aware of when it comes to these things of non-essentials. So if you missed last week, let me catch you up on maybe what, what I mean by non-essentials. There are churches, okay, that you can go to today, and probably even in Paul's time, maybe different issues then, but there are churches that you can go to today that, if you notice, there was three guys up here on stage today that had on hats. And some churches that you go to today will be like, don't wear the hat in here. There are some churches today that, as a man, if you walk in with shorts on, They'll be like, hey, you need to go home and go, go back and put some pants on and come back. See, some of y'all are feeling like, whoa, wait a minute, I've got a hat. Jonathan's like, bro, I came in on shorts today. What's happening? There are some churches that their drums are not allowed, right? In fact, there are some denominations where no instruments are allowed. You just sing with your voice. You have to pray that those people have a good voice because that's all you hear. Right? There are some places you can go that will say, well, you know, in this church, we don't believe that a Christian should dance. Right? Some of y'all may remember a famous 80s movie called what? What? There you go. Footloose, thank you for all my 80s people. A lot of that movie was based on a denomination. And I, I'll never, there's still to this day, people will say, because y'all know my background is Baptist, they'll be like, oh yeah, so you guys don't dance. I'm like, oh, footloose. Man, footloose. But see, these are all things that men came up with to create religi religiosity to create legalism, to, to create arguments, to divide, to divide people. 
God did not say any of those things. I grew up in a denomination that said, don't drink alcohol. And I'm pretty sure they said, don't smoke. Now, listen, I don't think you should smoke either. But the Bible does not say anything or reference anything to that nature. In fact, some of the things that the typical American eats are worse than cigarettes. Don't put that quote on Facebook, BJ, next week. <laughs> but it's true. Paul says that all things are permissible, but not all things are good. And that some of those things could even lead to sin, which can lead to death. And so Paul told us last week that when we, if we are the stronger brother or sister, if we've been in the faith, if we understand that these things are permissible, that we need not criticize our weaker brother and sister or condemn them because Christ has died for them too. He has saved them too. What we need to remember is to keep the main thing the main thing. Not to focus on the minor things, but focus on the essentials of the faith, the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives, maintaining unity and, shocker, loving each other. Now, a lot of those things are easy to say, but in application, it can be a lot harder to do. Amen? Remember last week I said that the mark of a true Christian is that we build up other believers. We saw that in the spiritual gift series that we did in the middle of Romans. That the main purpose of these spiritual gifts that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit sovereignly is not so that we can selfishly use them for ourselves. It's so that we can give them away to be a living sacrifice, as Paul says in chapter 12 of Romans, to build each other up for the common good and to glorify God. So what, no matter our differences in the non-essentials, that's what we need to focus on. And the vital component of all of that is unity and loving each other. See, if we look culturally into the world, we will see that the world likes to divide. The world likes to separate. Let me take you back to grade school and high school. Now, for some of you, it's been a while since you've been in high school. It's been a while for me too, okay? But even to this day, guess what you still have? You have your jocks. You have your nerds, you have your popular people, you have your emo weirdo people, right? And then you just have people that are not even in that category. They're just off to themselves, right? Why is that? Because the enemy wants to divide us. He wants to separate us. He wants to focus on our differences, but thanks be to God through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, no matter your differences, no matter what you look like or you wear or your ethnic background, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Amen? Come on, somebody. So today, we're going to pick up in verses 13 through 23, and we're going to kind of break this in sections. So let's... Let's read verses 13 through 15 with me. And if you didn't get a copy of your sermon notes, if you'll raise your hand, someone uh, on the Dream Team or our volunteers will bring you a copy. And here is what it says in verse 13. It says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. What Paul is saying here is, look, I, and, and let me back up for a second. Paul is really, in these verses, he is addressing the stronger brother here. And now in verse 14, he is identifying himself, even though he's a Jew, as a stronger brother. He has the same mentality, at least in practice, 
of the stronger brother of theology. That's why he says, nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. We're going to talk about that. Verse 15, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, if you hear nothing else today, hear this, you are no longer walking in love. In other words, what Paul is trying to tell us here in these first few verses of Romans chapter 14 towards the end here is that we don't need to put a stumbling block in the way of another brother or sister. In other words, this leads me to our first point this morning. And some of y'all are getting excited because you're like, oh, Pastor Matt's going to get done early today. The cheese dip's going to be hot instead of cold when I get to the Mexican restaurant. Here's the first thing that I think we need to see right away from these first set of verses is that we should never do anything that slows down, interrupts, impedes another believer's spiritual progress. I probably could stop right there. But Paul didn't, so I'm going to keep going. Now, that may seem obvious to you, okay? That we should never do anything that would damage another believer's discipleship process. But again, it's easy to say these things, but sometimes it's harder to actually do it in real life. Because here's the thing. When we believe something as humans, it's not usually like just intellectual. It becomes emotional. And our emotions get tied to it. And then when somebody comes against us that has a different belief on these non-essential things, we we just lose our stuff, right? The world would say it a different way, but I'm going to say it the church way. We just lose our stuff. Some of y'all are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Paul agrees with the stronger Christian that all food is clean and, and it's kosher, according to, not what he thinks, but according to what Jesus taught. If we had more Christians that would just do that one thing, just, well, what did Jesus say about these things? What did God say about these things? I think we would be way further along. Amen? However, Paul wants us to understand, and one of these stronger Christians in Rome to understand that just because they can eat anything and drink anything, that they have to consider the unity of fellowship with their weaker brothers and sisters. That they have to make room and respect the conscience of the weaker. And he's going to address that towards the end of this passage today. In other words... Just because we can eat anything and drink anything does not mean that we should fault that over the weaker brothers who are offended by it. If, for example, I was asked to go preach in another church that did not believe that you should wear hats, I would not go into that place of the Lord with a hat on just because I can That's what Paul's saying here. Or if I was invited to to preach or whatever at a church where the men don't wear shorts and they believe strongly in that, even though I know that's not biblical, I'm not going to walk up in there like Jonathan with my vest and shorts on today. I'm just not going to do it. You know I love you. Or like Josh, who's in a shirt and t-shirt and flip-flops out there. Right? Right? I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I know that in their conscience, they are believing that that is not worthy to the Lord. Okay? I talked about it last week. How many of us have grown up where they're like, well, on Sundays, you have to wear your Sunday best. Guess what? That's nowhere in the Bible. In fact, like I said last week, James warns us of that. He says, if you treat the brother that comes in dressed in shabby clothes any different than the rich man, there's a problem. That's a sin. And I can tell you, I, I've, I, this has happened to me before. In, in one of the churches that we went to for so long, I felt like if I didn't wear a three-piece suit every Sunday, I was looked down upon. Now, 
maybe that wasn't truly the case, but that's the way I was made to feel. And God forbid if someone walked into that church that was a different color than everybody else. They were made to feel unwelcome. That's not the gospel. So if we flaunt these things, if I was to go into a church that had these beliefs and just totally try to flaunt my freedom in Christ, that is literally putting a stumbling block in front of my brother or sister. Let me give you a more modern example that's going to challenge your denominational views. It would be much like if I was going to have dinner with someone who had struggled with addiction their whole life, maybe drugs, maybe alcohol, and me knowing that I have freedom to have a glass of wine, I decide to have that glass of wine at dinner in front of that person. I'm literally putting a stumbling block in front of that brother because he struggles with that addiction. That's what Paul is talking about here. We, we are not to flaunt these things because it violates their conscience. And they may be in a place where either they don't believe you should be doing it, which is what the weaker brothers and sisters believed here, or it may be something that they struggled with in the past that they can't get free from. Amen? Look at verse 15 again. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Listen, you can interject any example here that I've already said. Paul is using food because these Jewish Christians in Rome, they were thinking that you could not eat meat, that it was unclean. Again, in, in this time, the context, there was a lot of pork around. And if you read the Old Testament, that was one of the things that God had commanded the Jews not to eat was pork. Not to mention that they were also afraid, the weaker brothers and sisters, that a lot of this meat had been sacrificed, even the wine, in pagan services or pagan um, events. And so therefore, they didn't want to eat or drink it. They were, protect, they were trying to follow best they knew how what God had commanded them to do. See, whenever the stronger believes that he can eat whatever he wants in front of the weak, you're literally grieving them. That's what Paul says there. You're flaunting your freedom over them. And here's, what, here's the problem with that, is that by you doing that, you may cause them to leave the fellowship. You can grieve them so much, that's what Paul is saying here, that they could leave the fellowship and you will therefore break unity over something that you do not have to do. It's like I said last week, there are a lot of people in our society today, sometimes in the church, who like to argue. And it never fails that they will argue on the things that are the non-essentials, and it will create not only a spirit of legalism, but it will also create division. And it can cause people... Listen, there's been many churches that have separated or split over things like this. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know many churches that have literally divided over the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Come on. It's true. I'm not making that up. So what do we do if we are the stronger brother? How do we treat our weaker brothers and sisters? Paul tells us very clearly, which is why I underlined it in your notes today, that we have to walk in love. We see this throughout the whole gospel, that we are to walk in love. We are to love others first. Love has compassion for the weaker conscience. Love limits, hear me, its own liberty, its own freedom. Christ 
did this more, I don't know what the word I'm saying, but he did this better than anyone and more deeply than anyone. Before he went to the cross, when he was on the cross, don't you know that Jesus, just like they yelled out to him, well, if you're the king of the Jews, then call, call all these angels to come get you down. But see, Jesus knew there was something bigger and more important, which was fellowship with us. He had to atone for the sins of us, past, present, future. He was literally limiting his freedom for us. Here's the question we need to ask ourselves when it comes to these things. Am I hurting my brother or my sister by doing this? If, if I know that, I, again, if I'm going to have fellowship with another brother or sister in Christ who's in a different denomination or some kind of denomination where they believe differently than I do, and I know that, I'm not going to do something that would offend their conscience even though I know I have liberty in Christ to do it. Does that make sense? Y'all following me? Listen, the strong were right on their view of food and drink. They were right. Paul's admitting that. But just because they were right, he's like, you, you can't take that and then use it against the person who doesn't know any better yet. You've got to give them time. You've got to give them space for the Holy Spirit to mature them. Just like we talked about last week with Peter. When Peter was like, I'm not going to eat these things. And the Lord came to him in a dream and he showed him all this food. It's a very weird dream, right? And he, the God says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Again, that's another reason I don't think we're supposed to be vegan. That's another point. That's a non-essential, right? But what did Peter do? He's like, no, Lord. He told the Lord no. I'm like, Peter, you, you have some serious gusto in you for the Lord to speak directly to you in a dream and you say no. But God didn't get offended by Peter's no. He didn't strike him down and end his life right there. He knew that Peter needed mercy. He knew that Peter needed grace to grow and mature in the gospel, and he did. And this leads me to point number two today in our notes is that freedom is something that can be taken up and it also something that can be put down. Again, in my opinion, we see Jesus modeled this for us. He even spoke about it in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. And we're going to bring that up in just a minute in the notes. This is Jesus talking. He said, for this reason, the Father loves me because why I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. Verse 18, Jesus is clear here. No one's taking it from me. This is why Jesus didn't call 100,000 million angels to rescue him on the cross. He was willingly laying down the freedom of his life so that me, you and me could have eternal life. Amen? He says, I lay it down of my own accord. He's putting his freedom down. And he says, I have the authority to lay it down. And just in the non-essentials that we're talking about in this passage today, if you're the stronger brother, you have the authority to lay down your freedom so that it does not grieve your weaker brother or sister. Amen? He goes on to say, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And I believe we are receiving from the Father through the Apostle Paul, in this passage of Romans chapter 14, that listen, there may be times where you have the authority to lay down the freedoms that we have in Christ for the benefit of your weaker brother and sister. 
There's something else I don't want you to miss about these freedoms, about these non-essentials. And here's the thing, and this, this maybe applies more to things like wine or alcohol, for example. But it could apply to food as well. If you cannot put a freedom down, you are not free. You are enslaved. See, it's not my job to go to those people who vape or who smoke cigarettes or whatever and say, brother, you should put that down. You should do this and that. That's not my job. It's not my job to tell them you're an addict to that cigarette. But Holy Spirit can. Holy Spirit can say, uh, so-and-so, I've noticed that you can't even go a day without having a, having a glass of whatever. I've noticed you can't even go a day without having that vape or that cigarette. Now, granted, I believe the, you know, that's horrible for your health. You shouldn't do it, but you have the freedom to. But there are literally churches even today that teach that smoking is a sin. There are churches today that teach that tattoos are a sin. Guess what? That's not in the Bible. In fact, the verse that they reference for that out of, the, out of Leviticus is not talking about what we think of tattoos. It's talking about cutting yourself and mutilating your body, which was a pagan practice of that time. Has has nothing to do with the actual tattoos that we have today. But yet, because someone thought that that's what it meant, they take that and, and, and make it into something that God never meant it to be. Do you see how dangerous this can be? Do you see how the enemy can use it to divide us, to enslave us, to make us argumentative and legalistic? It's important. second half of verse 15, Paul says, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And he goes on in verse 16 to say, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that God has given us this meat, he's given us this wine as a gift for us to enjoy. But if we enjoy it in such a way that it offends and violates the consciousness of our fellow believer, then you enable them to go and speak evil of what God meant as good. You with me? Paul ties here in these verses love to the work of Christ on the cross and to the kingdom. He says, don't destroy the one who Christ died for because of food. Because Christ died for the weaker brother too. And so, because of that, we need to walk in love with him. Don't allow the freedom that you enjoy to be spoke of as evil. In verse 17, he says, for the kingdom of God... This is the only time in, in the book of Romans that the kingdom of God is mentioned, and it's mentioned right here. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying to us and to them, listen, listen, don't get it twisted. The kingdom of God is more important than food and drink. And again, you could substitute any of those things that I've already mentioned there. The kingdom of God is more important than it, whether or not you wear a hat into the service. It's more important or not whether you wear the suit or you wear the, the shirt and t-shirts into the service on Sunday mornings. It's more important than X, Y, Z. Because really, the kingdom of God is about righteousness, it's about peace, and it's about joy in the Holy Spirit. 
that is what Paul is saying really he matters. He's saying because of the righteousness of Christ. Remember, apart from Christ, me and you have no righteousness. Because of the righteousness of Christ in us, we can live righteous lives. We can live peaceful lives. And even in the midst of sorrow and turmoil and affliction, we can still be filled with the joy of the Lord. Amen? That is the kingdom of God at work in our everyday life. That's what makes us set apart from the world. And guess what? God will use that to draw unbelievers to Christ by seeing the fruit of righteousness in your life at work every day. By seeing the, the peace of life in your fellow co-workers or if you're at school and your fellow students and so on and so forth in your life. He will use the attributes of God working in and through you by the Holy Spirit to draw unbelievers to Christ. If you don't believe me, then just start walking this way every day if you're not. Begin by asking the Holy Spirit to empower you in these ways and watch what happens. People will come to you and they will say, Sonia, there's something different about you. Because I notice when the boss is like yelling at you and yelling at us, like you just still have this smile on your face. You're still joyful. Like you just seem at peace. Like how do you do that? And hopefully Miss Sonia would say, it's not me. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit at work in my life. The gospel is pretty clear to tell us that we know that we are His by our love for each other and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Amen? If people cannot tell that you are a Christ follower without you telling them something's wrong, something's amiss, Paul goes on to say that if we do this, if we walk in this way, if we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live righteous lives, live peaceful lives, live with joy by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are serving Christ, in verse 18, and we're acceptable to, not only to God, but other men will approve of this. That's why I believe if we will walk this way, if we will let the fruit of, of Christ abound in our lives, people will notice. Even people that claim there is no God. They will not be able to deny it because everybody else looks the same as them, except for those of us walking in His marvelous light. When we do that, it pleases God. And even other believers will hold that in high regard. Verse 19, Paul says, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. In other words, don't start getting out books and YouTube and Google to try to prove your point when you start to argue about these things. He's like, don't do that. You're wasting your time. Pursue this, pursue holiness, pursue peace, pursue joy in Christ. And most of all, do it so that we can build each other up. He goes on in verse 20, Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. In other words, don't destroy salvation that has come to this weaker brother or sister. Everything is is indeed clean. Again, Paul is restating here. He believes that the way that they're thinking is correct. Their theology is correct. But he goes on to say, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. He's telling us in these verses, in 19 to 21, this is how we need to live our life. He says in 21, it is good not to eat meat or 
drink wine, or, here he goes, do anything, whether that's use musical instruments, the way you dress, play cards, the way you wear your makeup, jewelry, etc., anything that causes your brother to stumble. A lot can be put in anything, right? He says in verse 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. In other words, God has given you the understanding that these things are okay. This food is clean. This drink is, is clean, whatever. Let that be between you or God. You don't have to go and argue that with that person. Isn't that what we want to do? We want to go and we want to prove our point. We want to go and, and argue, no, no, this is, this is the right way. He's telling us that at times we need to be willing to lay down our freedoms, to give up our freedom, to avoid division. In verse 22, the strong Christian is blessed because he can eat or drink anything and he's following his conscience without any guilt. But he says in verse 23, but whoever has doubts, whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. In other words, that person, the weaker brother who has doubts about eating the meat or drinking the wine, it violates his conscience. He, he's in conflict with the Lord on that. He's in conflict with them on that. And if he eats it, he will be condemned because the eating is not from faith. He's saying, in other words, it's wrong for them to eat the meat if you were to coerce them into it because it violates their own beliefs. And if they did that, it would mean that they're doing it not from faith, that God said it was good, that God said it was a gift, that God said it was okay, but they were coerced into doing it. And that is a sin. Here's, here's the reality. Throughout church history, and still today, there's been a lot of unnecessary divisions and arguments over things like clothes, makeup, playing cards. You know there's some churches that will tell you you can't even do, do anything with playing cards. Y'all know what I'm saying with playing cards? I'm not talking about gambling. I'm talking about playing things like spades or gin rummy or whatever, right? Our family's been playing cards for years, so I guess we're going to hell. It's like one of the things that we do as a family. There's so many things that we can divide over if we let the enemy allow us to do that. But someone, I don't know who, said something really important about all of these things. And here's what they said. In essentials, unity. What's an essential? Jesus is the Son of God. He's 100% man. He's 100% God. Right? If someone comes along and says, well, no, you can get to God through Buddha, okay, we got a major problem. That's not an essential belief of the Christian faith. So in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, freedom. But in all things, charity. Amen? Listen, if we divide ourselves over non-essential issues and we begin to criticize and tear each other down because of that, we are no different than the world. That's what the world does. They divide, they criticize, they tear each other down. Just look at one news report or cast of any of these rallies on either side. Politically. The enemy wants to divide us. 
That's not what a kingdom follower does. We look for ways to love each other. We look for ways to bless each other. We look for ways to give our spiritual gifts that Holy Spirit has given us away to each other. We look for ways to continue to be unified in the faith, despite our differences on what we may think about this, that, and the other. Let's not major on the minor things, but keep the main thing the main thing. The lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's very important. Unity. That's very important. Walking in love, as Paul tells us to do here and in many other epistles of the New Testament. He talks about walking in love, loving others as yourself. And building up our brothers and sisters for whom Christ died and whom he accepts. Amen? Is that something that you think we can do? It's possible? Some of y'all are like, no. I'm not going to call you out. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody was like, yeah, we can do that. BJ, you can come on up. Listen, I know that it's possible that I could have talked about some things that maybe you grew up in a church that was, you know, against a lot of these or they had rules against some of these things that I mentioned. And again, it goes back to why I encourage all of us, we have to get into God's word ourselves. And I know sometimes people will say, well, Pastor Matt, you don't understand. I don't really, you know... I'm not like you. I don't like to read or I don't, I don't have the kind of understanding that you have. Well, I don't have understanding either. But guess what I do have? The Holy Spirit. There's a lot of reasons God gave us the Holy Spirit, but one of them is to point us to Christ, to give us wisdom, to give us understanding of what God is saying in His Word. And the truth is, is that if you only come on Sunday mornings... You're only getting like this much of what God has for you. That's why we do community groups. That's why there has to be time that you get into God's word yourself. And listen, I, I'm telling you, there has been so many times where I read a passage of scripture. And I don't understand it either. But you know how good God is? It could be years later. God will bring me back to that same passage and I'll be like, wow, now I, now I get it. Now I understand. Because maybe at that time when I first read that passage of Scripture, I wasn't ready for it. And so by God and His sovereignty and providence, He's like, no, that's not, you're not ready for that yet. But when the time is right and his time is always perfect, he says, now you can know this. Amen? Why do you think that Jesus taught in parables? You know, the disciples were like, Jesus, we don't get it. Why do you talk like this? It's, it's hard for us to understand. It's because he wanted us to press in. And the people that were there, that were just there for Jesus' teachings for selfish reasons and really didn't believe in Him anyway, it cut them out. He says, if you will seek me, you will find me. If you will come after me like lost treasure, I will show myself to you. can't mature you. I cannot mature you in Christ. I can equip you. That's my job. Equip the saints for ministry. And if you're confused, you're the saints. I'm a saint, you're a saint. 
Now, I know if you came from a Catholic church, you're having struggles with that right now. But it's true. If you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God, you are a saint in Jesus. So take time to have communion with God. Pray. Before you complain, pray. For the love of God, before you gossip, pray. Before you go to criticize or argue or condemn your weaker brother or sister, pray. And remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 14. That we're not called to create arguments and division. We are called to walk in love. And sometimes that means laying down those liberties, those freedoms that we have in Christ so that we can maintain unity with our brother and sister in Christ. Amen. Amen.